Um, now I can go. <laughs> okay, um, so big welcome um, to all of you. I was going to start with what? Well, I'll do it anyways. Assalamu alaikum, marhaban bikum, Sayyidati, Sadati. Bienvenue, mesdames et messieurs. Bienvenidos, señores, señoras, and a big welcome. Um, to all of you, thank you for being here today. Um, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to be able to give this talk in all those four languages, so I'll keep it to English. Okay, um, so yeah, welcome. As you can see, the title for today up there is the 14 kilometer diaspora, Gibraltar's Forgotten Saviors. So um, again, it's a triggering title and that's the whole point of it. Um, the 14 kilometer diaspora, what the 14 kilometers relates to is basically the distance between Gibraltar and Morocco, okay, and the Straits. And today, we'll be talking about um, Gibraltar's biggest ethnic minority group, which is the Moroccan community, uh, but also with a bit of a personal touch. So, as you can see, some couple of pictures um, on top of me. Uh, some of you might not know what they are, um, and I shall explain them in a second. So, before I begin with the statistics, uh, there is a personal touch to this story. So, I was born in Morocco uh, back in May 1994. Um, and at that time, Moroccan workers here were not entitled to bring their families over. So I had to live away from my father and away from both my grandparents, because both my maternal and paternal grandparents worked in Gibraltar and came here when the frontier was, after the frontier was closed um, and did their bit, and, so, and one of them is still doing their bit till today. Um, so basically, all we were entitled to as Moroccan citizens whose parents worked and lived in Gibraltar was two months of summer visa. Okay. Two months of summer visa was all we were entitled to, and therefore we had to um, accept it and, and move on. And that's how it was. There was no way of dealing with it. So I came here in the summer of 97 um, as a three-year-old kid, and there I was playing, going to Quarry to swim. Um, and lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, the piece of skin in the corner of my eye, on my right eye, starts growing. Parents didn't know what it was. Cancer back then was still quite an unknown thing. It was mainly affecting people who are older in age, and not necessarily younger kids. Everyone thought, three-year-old kid, impossible. Um, so, as you can see the pictures up there, uh, the cancer started spreading, started off little in my eye, over here, started covering the whole eye, and the picture on the end is post-radiotherapy, um, and you can see the depression on the eye post-treatment. Thankfully enough, um, as we say in Gibraltar, que no hay mal que por bien no venga, as a result of the cancer that I ended up getting in 97, um, I was here in Gibraltar with the help of many people, and I'll name a couple of them towards the end of this presentation. Um, thankfully, they managed to stand side by, uh, side by side with my father and my mother, was sent to the UK for treatment to Royal Marsden, and eventually, upon my return, although unfortunately at the time there were many people who were lobbying against me staying in Gibraltar, um, there were others who were stronger than they were, and thankfully they stood by my parents, and I was given my residency, and I'm standing here speaking to you in English today. So I'll leave you with a question before I continue with the broader subject of this topic. Sorry, broader, broader subject of this, what we're speaking about today. Um, question is, would I be here talking to you in English, or would I be a member of this Gibraltarian community that we're all so proud of if I didn't have the cancer? Keep it in your heads. I might, would I be able to speak to you as I am today if I would have just left back to Morocco after those two months? Let's keep the question there, and we carry on. Okay, so, um, I'm using two case studies today, uh, sort of live case studies that we can relate to, but in no way am I saying that I'm speaking for every single um, person from the Moroccan community, because every single individual story is completely different. Each individual has lived it in their very own way. And for me to stand here and claim that, oh, I know this and I know that, no. I can claim to know my story, I can claim to know where it's led me today and where I am today, but I can't claim to know anybody else's. I just try and push the message across so that, unfortunately, again, with subjects such as these, um, they are quite taboo. We don't speak about them enough, and I think we should, and I think it should be a part of our history, which is so important to remember, because we always hear the forgive and forget. You can forgive. Forgiveness is something that we all should have, okay? But to forget, means to repeat. So we can't forget. It's something that we need to remember, remember continuously, and hence why I'm speaking about it today. So what we see up here is an extract from the People newspaper. Uh, I couldn't find the date, although I tried, but it says, expect nothing from the Gibraltar government, right over there. 
So it's from the Gibraltar government just there. Expect nothing from the Gibraltar government as directed towards the Moroccan workers that had gone out in protest over rights, over multiple things that we will um, touch on in a second. So the example here is of Amin bin Hammo, the owner of the Amin office that has changed hands recently, um, the restaurant, and his experience after 26 years on the rock and paying around 57,000 pounds in tax. Um, if he would have lost his job, he could be deported. Okay. Him and his wife uh, lived in not the best of accommodations, okay, as we've seen with Jonathan Scott's documentary on GBC recently, which highlighted the reality of life for many people. Um, it, it is tough, regardless. Um, again, not entitled to any form of subsidized or, um, sorry, Ooh, let's go back. Not entitled to any form of sort of government subsidized housing. A uh, couple of pictures there, and this is, these are the people I'll be speaking about um, in a second. We can see Jose Neto being dragged by police there for standing the ground and standing with the Moroccan workers. Something that I can assure you, none of them have forgotten to this day. And there are other characters like him and other characters who stood by me um, in my hour of need and in my family's hour of need, like uh, Bernard Linares, uh, God rest his soul. Uh, till this day, my father remembers him and tears come to his eyes because it was someone who didn't see me, and again, I'll, I'll do something in a second that uh, might, might seem a bit weird, but um, when you look at someone, you, he doesn't see me for something different. You're a human being, you've got a heart that beats. I can help you, it's humanity at the end of the day. It's not whether you're Moroccan, whether you're Chinese, whether you're Gibraltarian, whether you're Spanish. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with humanity at the end of the day. And if all of us were to focus on that, the world would be a much better place. Um, yeah, I mean, Ben Hamu's story, basically, he wasn't allowed to um, bring his wife. The rule back then was, if you were working in Gibraltar, your wife could only come if she had a job. And to bring their wives, they'd have to find cleaning jobs um, with sort of um, armed forces, wives in the houses of people that were here with the armed forces, etc. That was like the loophole that Moroccan workers could access. Um, the story here, which really touches me about Amin bin Hamu's wife, it's a story of many Moroccan mo mothers at the time is that she was pregnant, she went to the doctors um, for a checkup. they told her a delivery date, the doctor immediately called the um, authorities and said this Moroccan lady is pregnant. So the authorities, the police, followed her home and said, if you don't leave by the time you deliver, we will forcibly um, repatriate you, okay? Why, you may ask? Well, of course, if the baby is born in Gibraltar, then is technically a British citizen and entitled to his rights. And that is something that we did not allow back then. Again, I do say, forgive, but don't forget. These things are part of our history. We need to embrace them, we need to learn them, and to drive away any existing resentment the minute we accept them and say, wow, what a time to be alive, what a time how people stood up for their rights and how we've changed and what we've become today, that is something we need to applaud ourselves for as a community. Regardless, so that was just one example of many, and that's Amin Ben Hamu's wife. The son, Ilyas, uh, is a friend, and he, he's actually a Borders and Coast Guard employee today. So, um, and if I'm not wrong, that was the oldest son, and that was him. Um, more pictures showing Moroccan ladies, just over here, sitting, I'm sorry, but the projection, you might not see it as well, Moroccan ladies sat over there. This is in the airport. They sat in the airport in protest, and at the time, the airport was the only, sorry, the only method of sort of bringing things in to Gibraltar. Um, and to cut it off, to have people sat there was a big problem. So they had to try and deal with it quickly. More pictures of men and women being forcibly removed by police, and they were protesting in peace. Before I move on to the next slide. Yeah, God. Can you still hear me? Yeah? I was never good at artistic impression, but that's my best take. Um, yeah. I might look different, but have I really changed? God knows. Let's keep that as another question in your heads. Um, so yeah, more pictures. Mum, Dad, is the suit okay? Yeah? Go on. Don't want them telling me off later. Um, so yeah. Um, again, more pictures of that demonstration. And that wasn't the only demonstration they did. There was others outside the convent. There was um, people talking for their rights. Um, Mohammed Sarsari from the Moroccan Workers Association. He's up on 
Okay, so this is more police, police dogs. Mohammed Salsali is over there, again, being forcibly removed himself. We can see a bit of a chokehold on another Moroccan worker there. Was that required? God knows we're not here to judge. We're here to show certain things. And again, I didn't say this at the start, which I should have, but apart from not being able to tell everybody's story, <laughs> 15 minutes is nowhere near enough to highlight the plight of the Moroccan workers here in Gibraltar. It is nowhere near enough. And again, what I'm trying to do in these 15 minutes is stimulate um, discussion, stimulate talks, see where we're actually lacking as a community, see where, lack, where we're lacking in our history, in our public services, in what these Moroccan workers did for our community. So if I look at dates, and I remind myself here, the border was closed for over 13 years, okay, initially opened just for pedestrians, and then opened for motor vehicles later on, but it spanned from 1969 all the way to 83 and then 85, if I'm not wrong, oh, it's over here. Yeah, 82, 15th of December 82, it was open to pedestrians, and then in 85, it was opened um, to motor vehicles. So in all this time, Gibraltar lost the Spanish workforce, and therefore, they had to bring someone. They brought the Moroccan workforce, over 2,000 um, laborers, who, without whom, okay, um, Gibraltar might not be the Gibraltar we know today. And why do I say this? I, I like backing my things with evidence. My uni professors would be proud because I reference and I cite. Okay, so, um, apart from a couple of laws I wrote down here to remember, Sir Robin Maxwell Hyslop, a former Tory MP, this is taken directly from Parliament Archives, um, said on the 27th of July, 1983, so this is when the border was already open for pedestrians. He said, it would be a dishonorable day for Britain if we overlooked the interests of those people without whom, I repeat, the economy of Gibraltar would undoubtedly have collapsed following the closure of the frontier. Does my honorable friend accept that it was the wish of the Spanish government that it should collapse, but that many Moroccan workers filled the gaps and enabled Gibraltar to survive? Okay, this is directly from an MP, a Tory MP for Tiverton, which is next to Exeter. Um, so this was a conversation that some people higher up were having, but unfortunately, it didn't trickle down um, at the right times. Pardon me. So, again, pardon the pun, but Moroccan workers in Gibraltar were stuck between a rock and a hard place, okay? Literally. Um, it was difficult for them. Um, it was difficult for many of their families. And although I was given the right for residency, I still recall difficulties in my childhood with something so basic that if I spoke to you about it now, you'd be like, wow, okay? I didn't have a passport, and I wasn't entitled to a British passport until the age of 18. Why? Because neither of my parents had a British passport. Therefore, it meant I was locked into Gibraltar, and if I needed to go into Spain, we had to go to the UK to get a Spanish visa to be able to do that. I recall days when I was going um, for doctor's appointments um, for my treatment, and we'd try our best, my father and I, to find un huequecito, to get an appointment in the Spanish embassy to get that visa and be able to cross the border. If not, we'd be locked off. So trips to Bahia Park, for example, down the road in Algeciras. For a while, I couldn't go. And then after a bit, when we started uh, having good chats with the Spanish authorities, um, I'd have to go a week before with some of my teachers, so big thank you to all my teachers that helped with that, you know who you are. Um, and I'd have to sign certain papers to be allowed out. So all of these things, and again, so much more I could be speaking at. I'm looking at the timer, and God, it's scaring me. Um, so uh, I'd like to say something else. And again, these quotes, they hit home because they're very important. In Panorama on the 10th of December 2010, a report written by UNITE, okay, supported by the Trade Union Research Unit in Oxford, was published on the eve of the International Day of Human Rights. The report proved that the Moroccan community are very hard workers, pay their taxes, take very little back. In other words, net contributors to the economy. It is now time to end over 40 years of discrimination and to give these hardworking people, and sorry, hardworking and loyal workers the same rights as the rest of the population. Um, they also went on to describe the treatment as economic racism, research reveals. And following this, another 54-page um, report by a barrister called Daniel Blackburn, Professor Keith Ewig, Professor of Public Law, um, and Jonathan Jeffries, a lecturer in trade union education, um, under the umbrella of the ICTUR, um, with the help of Jose Neto, the help of people like Bernard Linares. Um, and they wrote this 54-page article. It was presented by Charles Cisarello, District Officer for UNITE. And it further complemented the stance 
of the initial findings, um, and leading lawyers like Karen, what's her name? Karen Monaghan in, in the UK. Um, I'll wrap it up, apologies. Um, yes, there is a lot more left for this, but thank you so much for listening. Maybe at some other point. Um, thank you for having me, Julian. Thanks for the rest of the team, and thank you for listening.